We are so glad you're with us. We are continuing our series called I Pity the Fool. We've been going through it the last several weeks. And um, next week, we will be putting a bow on this series. And so uh, make sure to come back next weekend. Today, I'm going to be continuing the series, though. And uh, I'm going to be continuing it in Proverbs chapter 31. We've been walking through the book of Proverbs. If you've not been with us, we've been walking through the book of Proverbs for the last several weeks. And we've been getting wisdom so that we are not the pool whom Mr. T pities. We don't want to be the guy. We don't want to be the, the woman that Mr. T, you know, has to say, I pity the fool who does something stupid. But, but here's the truth. Um, we all do stupid. You know, we said from the beginning that the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, which means you inherit it. You get it honest. You don't have to go to school to be the fool, right? You, every all got a PhD in dumb. We all, whether we like to acknowledge or not, we all have done plenty of stupid in our lives. And, um, and so the question is not like, you know, are we a fool or can we be a fool? It's, it's how do we, instead of walking down that way, that the Bible says there's a way that seems right, right to a person, but that way doesn't end the way we think it would. It doesn't lead us to where we want to go. That actually the way that leads us to the way we want to go is the way of wisdom, the way of God. And so we have been uh, studying in just different parts of our lives because the book of Proverbs is so pragmatic and so practical, so many different parts of our lives that Proverbs gives us wisdom and shows us this is what it looks like to be a fool in this part of your life. And this is what it looks like to be wise in this part of your life. And but walking through the book. We're toward the end of the book right now. In fact, Proverbs chapter 31 is the last chapter of the book of Proverbs. We are going to come back next week and got one more message to bring, but I'm already at the end of the book and um, just want to share with you. I, I was going to share with you the whole text, Proverbs 10 through 31, but for time's sake, I'm going to read you the first verse in this section and the last verse in this section. Um, and for some of you, this may be a, a, a section that you're familiar with. Um, oftentimes this is called, the section of the Bible is called the virtuous woman. Um, and uh, w what I want to do today is show you that w while um, Solomon is, is writing this, this book is addressed to his son. So this is instruction for a young man. So he's trying to teach him about relationships and he's talking about the kind of woman that he should, you know, uh, uh, be looking for. Um, I think that these uh, principles apply across gender lines. So it's not just while, while Solomon is teaching his son about what a virtuous woman looks like, I think we can find out what a virtuous man looks like as well in these verses. And so we're going to start with verse 10 and read verse 31, and then we'll jump in. Uh, Proverbs 31 and 10, a wife of noble character who can find, she is worth far more than rubies. And verse 31, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works Bring her praise at the city gate. My title today, if you're writing down notes, is Wise Wives. Wise Wives <laughs> and Husbands. Because I do think that we're going to find wisdom not just to be wise wives. I, I want to call it that because y'all know I love me some alliteration. And it's alliterative and it rhymes. Wise Wives and Husbands. Let's jump in. Let's pray. Father, right now, give us, give us wisdom from your word. Teach us. Uh, Father, I pray that we would, um, our hearts would be open, our minds would be open, and we'd be ready to receive your word and to respond to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Wise wives. I want to share with you um, six things here from the book of Proverbs that I, I think uh, are so helpful as Solomon is teaching uh, his son. Now, how many of you know that um, uh, when it comes to your children, uh, again, sometimes they're really bad at doing what you say, but great at doing what you do. And how many of us can be honest that we've kind of like, hey, do what I say, not what I do. And if there's anybody who should probably say that with regards to wisdom about uh, relationships and marriage, it should probably be Solomon. You, you remember he had hundreds of wives and hundreds of other concubines, like a, a thousand women total in his harem. And so Solomon was probably a guy that's probably like, hey, do, do what I say, don't do what I do. Um, it would probably have been good wisdom for Solomon's sons and for those who are learning 
learning from him. Uh, Solomon here gives us some insight into, um, into uh, in this case, a wife, but again, I think a, a spouse, somebody who, is, who has the right kind of character and who has value that is ultimately, Solomon says, is more valuable than rubies. And I want to talk about really two kind of different um, uh, ways to look at this. I want to talk about, first of all, um, how we find a good spouse and then how uh, we become and how we ourselves are a good spouse. And so the first part I want to talk about, um, we're going to use two, two tools that Solomon, I think, would kind of use as he's talking about, he's talking to his son. The first one, we're using the magnifying glass. So when you use a magnifying glass, you're trying to find something, right? You have seen Sherlock Holmes and you know, I don't know if, if like detectives really use these, I'm guessing not, but you know, like if you're looking for something, you're using the magnifying glass because obviously, you know, I guess when, he, when you go, if you got one like this, it's got the little circle in the middle. Anybody know what that is? Anybody know what that little circle, that little, that little glass in the middle is? That's the old people's circle. I love y'all. Like that's the for real. You want to like put it over a word? That thing gets like, it's like a hundred X. Sorry, you know, for those of you who may be, your, 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 your sight might be limited. God bless you. Um, but that's what that is, if you didn't know. Um, <laughs> I'm helping you out. You're trying to, I'm trying to find, you know, like, I don't know. I, my, my, my granny used to have one of these. She, she, would, she did word searches, you know. She's looking for a word. And like, she, so, you know, we're trying to find something. And so the first part of Solomon's wisdom has to do with the kind of person that we're trying to find. So, so we're talking to some single folks, all the single people in the house. Come on. We're, we're talking about what kind, what kind of person should we be trying to find? Proverbs 18 and 22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and, and receives favor from the Lord. I find that verse interesting. He who finds a wife because the insinuation is that uh, when he finds her, she is already a wife, even though she's not his wife, right? He, not, not he who finds a woman and then marries her and makes her a wife, but he who finds a wife. And the insinuation is that even before she's married, she has the qualities of a wife. Can I just say, men, that if, you're, if you are looking, you should find a wife, not find a woman and then try to make her a wife. Ladies, you should find someone who already embodies the qualities of a godly husband instead of trying to find a man and then make him a good husband. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. I would say she who finds a husband finds a good thing. And so we're talking about what we're looking for as we're trying to find that person and three qualities really quickly. I want to lift up that Solomon in Proverbs 31 offers up three qualities that we're looking for. If you're, if you're single, come on, if you're single, break out the magnifying glasses. We're going to start looking for somebody. Um, if you're, if you're married, um, this part's not for you because you already picked them. You be uh, now, but you'd be like, well, wait a minute. The one I got doesn't do that. Too late. I'm going to get to the next part. Come on, the first part we're going to talk about finding. The next part we're going to talk about fixing. So if you already married, you ain't finding nobody. You already found them. Proverbs 31 and 10. A wife of noble character who can find... Again, we're looking for somebody, and here's what we're primarily looking for, we're trying to find, is someone of character. Come on, we're looking at character over, over cute. She is worth far more than rubies. A woman of character, verse 25, she is clothed with strength. And dignity, she can laugh at the days to come. Verse 30, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. What kind of wife am I looking for? What kind of husband am I looking for? We are looking for character. We're not just looking for cute. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be attracted to them, but I'm saying, first of all, you don't need a magnifying glass to see if they're cute. I mean, you know, unless maybe you really do have some problems with your eyes, but you like, you can see they're cute from a, from a, from
from a good ways off. The truth is some people look a lot better from distance. And I'm not just talking about physically. I'm not just talking about the people that when you get close, you're like, oh, I didn't realize. I'm talking about some folks, some folks, you can meet them one time, you spend a little bit of time with them, and you think, man, this might be the one, but if you look close enough to their character, all of a sudden, cute ain't so cute. And so here, I'm going to give you three things we're looking for, three qualities, and the first one is they're God-fearing. A woman that fears the Lord, again, I'd say a man that fears the Lord is to be praised. We're talking about character. We're talking about, we're talking about the things that really matter. We're talking about who they are, not just what they look like. And again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be physically attracted, but Solomon says, and Solomon had all the finest wives, right? He had all the fine ladies, but Solomon acknowledges beauty fades. Come on. Cute don't last forever. Like hopefully you stay together long enough for cute not to last anymore. Like, come on, let's be like, when we 105, I mean, it's cute, but it's a different kind of cute, right? When Papa's holding Mama's hand, that's cute. But like, it's not physical beauty. It is the beauty of the relationship. That's what we value. So I'm not just looking at, at the physical part that is going to change. Come on, gravity's a reality. Come on, somebody. It's, it's called the law of gravity. It's gonna happen, come on. Wrinkles come, hair goes, but a woman, a man who fears the Lord is to be praised. I just need to give some single folks some advice because some of y'all, you get, once you just see them and they're so cute, and so you, once you see they're cute, you just put the magnifying glass away. You gotta get past the cute and you gotta get into character. You got to start digging into character and the, and the starting place for Solomon, he says, the, the thing that's most important in regards to character is do they fear the Lord? Now, if you weren't with us, uh, when we kicked the series off, we talked about when we, in the very first installation of this series, we talked about the foundation, a uh, foolish foundation, a foolish foundation is, uh, the Bible says that, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning or the foundation of wisdom. It's the starting place of living a life of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord just means acknowledging God as God. So it's that I'm, I'm willing to honor God. I'm willing to, I'm willing to value God. I'm willing to submit to God. I'm willing to serve God. And here's what I would say. If they won't honor God, why would they honor you? If they won't submit to God, why would they submit to you? If they won't serve God, why would they serve you? That, 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 that if somebody doesn't fear the Lord, if they don't honor God, they're probably not going to honor you. I love what Martha Beck said. I shared this with our staff this week. Um, I came across this quote re recently. I didn't know who it was from. I looked it up. It's from Martha Beck, who's an author. And I love what she said. She says, how you do anything is how you do everything. So we're talking about character. I'm looking at your character and how you respond. Your relationship with God is going to show so much about the, the, the future relationship that we might have. How you do anything is how you do everything. How you treat people is how he going to treat you. Come on, how he treats his mama, how she honors her dad. How we do anything is going to reflect oftentimes in how we do everything. What is their character like? God fearing. One of the reasons for, for me and Crystal, you know, we, uh, um, we, we've been together now, gosh, how long has it been? Almost 16 years, about a month and a half away from our 16th anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's been great. And, and it hasn't always, like, every moment hasn't been great, but it's been great. And, and you know, we just... For us, um, divorce has never been on the table. Like, we don't use the D word. And here's the reason why. I really feel like the reason why for us, it's not that everything's always been good for us. It's that, it's that both of us, we fear the Lord. And so we honor God and we honor his word. And so we don't use the D word because we obey his word. And so for us, we just like both of us, like we're in this thing. Now listen, it takes two people to be in this thing. If, if you get two people who are willing to submit to God, put him first, in their lives and first in their marriage, I promise you can get through anything. If you got one person who is and one person who isn't, then that's 
imbalanced and we're, 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 we're not going in the same direction and that doesn't always work out well. But I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, if two people decide, no matter what they're going through, hey, we're going to honor God, we're going to put God first. If you put God first, if both of us put God first, we will get closer together. So, sometimes there's a, 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 an illustration used and it's this triangle, right? And you've got the two persons, husband and wife at the bottom and God at the top. And, and listen, when, for the triangle, as, as we both get closer to God, the only way that works is if both of us then at the same time get closer to, together. A person who fears the Lord, are they God honoring? Here's the next one. Solomon talks about it a lot throughout the book of Proverbs, but especially here in Proverbs 31. They're God fearing. Number two, they are hardworking. Come on, somebody. Come on, I'm talking to some. I'm helping the single folk, some single folk out. They got a job. They might have two jobs. They're, they're not lazy. Let me read it for you. Proverbs 31. And again, Solomon is talking about this woman, but I'm, I'm certainly um, of the opinion that if Solomon believed this, you know, this wife ought to be this industrious, hardworking, and, 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 and willing to, to labor, then her husband should be just as, if not more so. Proverbs 31, 13, she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. Verses 17 and 18, she sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable. Come on, she got a business. She's an entrepreneur. She is, the Bible says she, she, she buys and sells stuff. She, she, she makes things. She, she, her lamp, I love this, her lamp does not go out at night. Verse 27, she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Hard working. Can, can I say this? Um, marriage is work. Now it's good work, but it's hard work. Hard, hard doesn't mean bad and easy doesn't mean good. Marriage is a good, it's a good thing. Whoever finds a wife finds a good thing. It doesn't say it finds an easy thing. Don't laugh too hard, gentlemen, right? I don't know what he's talking about. Right answer. Right? And it doesn't say it's going to accept you, that if you find a wife, you find an easy thing. You, you get married, you, you stepped into something easy. It's that you stepped into something good, but something good can also be something hard. It's work. And if they won't work, like if they won't work at work, then they might not work at this. If they're unwilling to put in the work. And so Solomon says, when you're looking for somebody, they're cute. Yeah, they're cute on the couch. Come on. It's like, can I just, can I be real with you? Um, my, I don't like, my wife, I think she thinks I'm cute, but she never thinks I'm more cute than when I'm like washing them dishes. I know it too. So I, I'd be like, hey, you know, like when I'm doing something, I'm putting some effort in, I'm working. And I'm doing something that I know maybe she doesn't love to do or she, you know, I can help her out. Man, there's nothing more attractive. I'm just trying to help you. I know they're cute, but when they're cute and they're laying on the couch and you're working your fingers to the bone, all of a sudden, cute, don't cut it. One of the things, I honestly, one of the things that, that, that uh, really drew my attention to my wife and was a big part of why I fell in love with my wife and why I ultimately chose my wife to be my wife was that she was one of the hardest working people I met. She just, she was, she never stopped. And still to this day, if you know her, she, she just, and I don't mean she can't hang out and relax and have a good time, but I mean she's always, she's always doing something. She's always, she's always thinking about somebody. She always, she always working on something. She always, you know, preparing something, doing something. And I love that. I, I think we ought to look for people because it takes work to be married. We ought to look for people, young people. Woo! I'm just telling, I'm trying to help you. This is, if somebody's not willing to work, like the Bible says, if you're not willing to work, you shouldn't eat. I think also, if you're not willing to work, you shouldn't get married. If you don't have a job, come on. And I'm not just saying just work at your job, but I'm just saying just in general, and I'm not saying worshiping your work and being a, work, a workaholic. Workaholism is worshiping my work. But, but, but being diligent means I worship through my work. Because biblically speaking, worship and work are tied together. 
Worship isn't just what you do on Sunday and work is what you do on Monday through Friday, but my work is my worship in many ways. What I do with my life, how I use the energy, the time, the resources, the abilities that I have is, is a way for me to honor God. And so do they, are they, are they God fearing? Are they hard working? Come on, some of you, I've already like, you should already know he ain't the one. And you're mad at me and you ought to be happy. You ought to be thanking me. You should send me a card in the mail saying, thank you that you helped me. And maybe in the three or four or 12 years, is he God-fearing? Is she God-fearing? Are they hardworking? And here's the last one Solomon talks about in Proverbs 31. Are they others serving? Others serving. Proverbs 31, 15. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. Verses 20 and 21. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She takes care of people. He takes care of other people. And I would say, I would say all of these are so critical. This one may be the most important one. I mean, I, I don't know if you're, if you're not God fearing, it's hard to give me others serving. So that may be the beginning. But this one, if there's anything you're looking for, whoo, I need to see, can you serve other people? Do you have a servant's heart? Because the most miserable marriages I've ever seen, and unfortunately, part of my job, Part of my role is that sometimes I get uh, an up-close view at some uh, dysfunctional relationships, marriages that aren't working out. I, I'm on the phone with people or I'm in a, in a room with people and we're having a conversation and so many times, in fact, I dare say, invariably, if somebody, if there's a marriage that isn't working, at the heart of it, there's somebody who's not a servant. Selfish people destroy marriages. And, and here's the problem. We're all wired that way. Like we're all built. The human nature is to be me first. But when I get married, like uh, uh, this marriage ceremony is, is like part burial and part birth. There's no, like me is gone and us is now here. And it doesn't mean I cease to be my own person but I cease to be oriented toward just what's in it for me and what's best for me. And all of a sudden now my filter is not about me, but about us, not about me, but about you. And if you, I'm just telling you, you want a recipe for a miserable life, marry a selfish person. Marry somebody who doesn't want to serve you. You want, you want a recipe for a great life, for a great marriage, marry somebody, find somebody who has a servant's heart, who wants to bless other people. And listen, particularly when, when they can't get anything from them. So not just serving you when he wants something from you. And if you don't know what he wants from you, we can talk later. I'm talking about will, will he, will she serve people who can do nothing for them? How do they treat other people? How do they respond to other people? Not just to you. Oh, they're, they're nice to me and they're so sweet to me, but they treat everybody else nasty. At some point, because again, how I do anything is how I'm going to do everything. How I'll treat somebody else is ultimately how I'll treat you. Now, I may treat you with a higher degree of that thing. So if, 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 if he'll be nasty to them, He'll just be even more, it'll just multiply. The nature of marriage is that it'll multiply. So that's why, that's why you see something like people, you never thought they'd go that far, but in a relationship. Y'all been watching this trial go on for the last, I don't even know why y'all care so much. It's, right? And like, yeah, it's like, why are these people so crazy, so mad? Because that's what, like, that's what passion and love and, and marriage will do. It'll multiply. So if, if she is, like, if she's mean, she's going to be really mean to you eventually. She'll be really nice maybe right now, 
That thing's going to turn around at some point. Do they have the heart of a servant? I love what one pastor said once. He said, he said marriage is a race to the back of the line. The way you win in a marriage is that you don't run to the front to get your way. You run to the back of the line to prefer your spouse above yourself. And when you have two people who decide to live that way, two servants who are just heaven bent on serving each other. No, 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 no. I want to serve you. No, I want to serve you. No, no, no. By all means, you know. You say that, that that's that's not reality. And I get it. I get it. I get it. it but 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 if you can, if, I'm, you're looking for somebody. I'd be looking for somebody. Oh, look how he serves. Look how he serves his family. Look how he look how he helps other people. Look how generous she is. Look how they serve. Come on. Some of y'all need to, y'all, y'all in the right, right place. You're in church. Y'all just need to jump on the serve team. <laughs> they got a servant's heart. They're other serving. The magnifying glass. I'm looking at what I'm trying to find in a spouse. I hope that helps you. Now we're going to switch it up. Because Solomon just doesn't talk about the qualities that either we should have or that we should look for in a spouse. He's not just talking about finding, but I think he also gives us some insight into fixing our, our, our marriage. So for some of us, we're looking for it. We want to find the right. We want to find a good spouse. But now let's talk about how we fix a marriage because every marriage has some issues and so the tool changes from the magnifying glass this I used to find it now I got to use something to fix it and it's not a hammer and it's not a screwdriver it might not be what you would ex expect the thing I use to fix the marriage is the mirror you, you gonna fix your hair what do you use Right? I got to go fix my hair. You don't do that. You don't go into like the closet where there's no, and, and it's dark and you go fix your hair. Good luck. When I go fix my hair, need me that mirror. Come on. Because here's the thing about a relationship. In, in a marriage, we want to fix our marriage. And what we really mean by that is we want to fix our spouse. But you can't fix anybody but you. And the moment you start trying to fix a marriage by fixing and changing somebody else, all you do, it's like using the magnifying glass. Because that's what we do. We try to use what we, what we were supposed to use to find them. Now we try to use it to fix them. Because we weren't looking for it when we were dating. That's some of our problem. Some of us, we should have seen what we could have seen when we were dating, but we didn't want to look for it. He's amazing. You might want to look at this. No, he's gorgeous. You don't understand how cute he is, right? He's, and, 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 and all this stuff's going on, and he's, yeah, but he's got some issues. Yeah, but I don't want to hear it. And so then I get married, and then the magnifying glass that I should have been, all of a sudden I take it out. That's why, that's why uh, uh, one, uh, one wise man said, you go into marriage with eyes wide open and after half shut. You know what he's saying? The magnifying glass is for before I do, not after. Because if you start going around in your marriage, now I'm looking for something that's wrong in your life. You know, you can find something with a magnifying glass, but you can also fry something with a magnifying glass. Get those lights just right. Seen somebody ever torch an ant with a magnifying glass? And you're like, I'm going to fix him. I'm going to fix him. I'm going to fix him. No, you're going to fry him. You're going to frustrate them. You're going to fixate on what's wrong. But fixating on what's wrong does not fix what's wrong. Because at the end of the day, the only thing I can fix is me. And so how do I fix my relationship? Well, I got to fix myself. I can take responsibility for myself. So married people, I want to give you three things that you can do, but you don't understand them. I might not. 
I'm not saying they don't need to get fixed. What I'm saying is you can't fix them. In fact, the best way for you to influence them is for you to, you to change, you to submit to God, you to do what's right. And I found that when I do that, all of a sudden, when I do what God's calling me to do, that he'll work on my wife. So two, three things to do. So we looked at three qualities to look for. Now I want to talk about three actions to take. And in, in, in the first, like, it's super easy. And, and these, are not, these are not groundbreaking and not hard to understand, but they might be a little bit difficult sometimes to do. Here's the first one. Be nice. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Be nice. I'm going to show it to you. You ready? You understand, preacher. <laughs> Just be nice. Proverbs 31 and 12. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. I love that verse. She adds value to him. She brings good. Some verses, versions say she does good to him, not harm to him. She does good things to him. She, she does that. And notice all the days of her life. I'm talking about a wise wife. I'm talking about a wise husband. They add value all the days. And that's important because some of us only want to do good when we feel good. Not all the good days of my life, not all the, all the easy days of her life, but all the days of her life, she does good. You know, studies show that, that simple kindness is one of the most important qualities in a marriage and one of the greatest telltale signs in whether or not a marriage is going to last. There's a, a famous study done, done by John Gottman. Um, he uh, created uh, the University of, of Washington. He created uh, what was called the Love Lab, and he studied newlywed couples. And he studied them, and they hooked them up to all kinds of stuff. They did all these studies, ran all these studies on them. And then they let them all go their way, and six years later, they brought them back found out which ones were still happily married and which ones were divorced or were miserable. And he broke them up into two different categories. He called them the masters and the disasters. And, and what he looked for was, what is, what's the commonality between these groups? What, 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 what makes the disasters disastrous and the masters masterful? And one of the things they noticed is that um, whenever uh, the, the couples were together and they were asking them questions, they could be the most mundane questions. They could be asking them about breakfast. They could be asking them about anything. The disasters, their, their uh, physiological uh, uh, responses during that time were all elevated. The, 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 the researchers were shocked. They said, these people look like they're in the middle of fight or flight. Their adrenaline is pumping. Like, they are ready at any time for a bear to jump out and have to either run away or fight them. That's, and the reason is because they're in a relationship where at any time, whoosh, at any time, we're just talking about breakfast, and it can turn into a fight. It goes on to say that, that this idea of, of, uh, of contempt was the number one predictor in a miserable or failed marriage, contempt. Contempt just means um, a, a blatant disregard for, a disrespect for, a dislike for. Contempt. He goes on to study, and they, they did further studies, and they, they, they noticed that, that many times throughout the day, uh, people make what, what he called bids. Bids. And a bid is just uh, some kind of invitation for connection. And it can be something as simple as telling them what happened at work today or mentioning something they saw, you know, uh, on the TV or whatever it may be, very, oftentimes very simple things, but that underneath these things, these are invitations for, for connection. And, and the masters, um, he said there are two responses. You turn toward the person or turn away from the person when they have a bid, when they, when they maybe strike up a conversation, when whatever it may be, that, that the masters, almost nine times out of ten, they would respond and turn toward them. So they show interest, they're just nice. If, if nothing else, they want to listen to how their day went, whatever it may be. But the disasters, only about 30% of the time, 70% of the time, they ignored them, or they shot them down, or they just, just content. 
You know what they say about contempt? Familiarity breeds contempt. It says contempt is the number one sign that a marriage is going to fail. Kindness is one of the greatest predictors that a marriage is going to succeed. I'm just talking about doing good, being nice, being thoughtful. The problem is familiarity breeds contempt. You know what living together with somebody for years and decades will produce? Familiarity. And the tendency is that our familiarity does not lead to greater kindness. It leads to greater opportunities for contempt. It was, it was that thing they do, you know, that was cute. You know how they, how they, you know, chew their food with their mouth open. How, how, you know, you know, he's just real creative and just, you know, not very clean. And it's, at first it's cute until it's not. And if we're not careful, familiarity breeds contempt. And before we know it, we're short. We're just nasty. We're just not nice. And of all the things that you think make up, you know, a good marriage, I'm telling you, like, like you can change the, the temperature in your marriage just by some kindness, just by being nice, doing something, saying something kind. Be, just try it. No, I can't do that. You know how hard it's time to be nice is when you fight? And, and, and these studies show that the most important time to be nice is when you're fighting. Is it, when something's going on, when there's tension, and there's that the greatest way to build that bridge back is somebody's just got to be willing to be nice. And we get in this place where, well, you hurt me, so now I'm going to hurt you. And now we just nasty one-up everybody, right? It's just we ratchet it up. That's why you find yourself sometimes you said something that you should know you, you didn't even mean. You didn't even say it because you meant it. You said it because it would hurt them. I was trying to hurt you because you hurt me. I'm talking about, you know, first grade marriage wisdom. You hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. Can we, it's childish. We do it. And it'll just, like, it, that doesn't end well. You reap what you sow. So I sow nasty, and somehow I think I'm going to sow nasty, and that's going to change their mind. You know what? I'm going to be nasty to them so they realize that they hurt me, and then, they'll, and then they'll start being nice to me. Tell me how that's working for you. You reap not what you, you don't reap what you, what you hope to sow. You reap what you do sow. You reap the fruit of your actions. Be nice. Here's the second one. Speak life. Be nice, speak life, Proverbs 31. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. And I just got to be honest with you, this one of these, I just need to, This isn't just a mirror. This one is two-sided mirrors. Like there's this is the regular mirror, and then this mirror, you see every poor, <laughs> every imperfection. And the Bible says that the word of God is like that, 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 that if we're willing to, to let it, it, it can be like when we hear the word of God, it's like we're looking into a mirror and it shows us what manner of person we are. Do you know that marriage is also like that? Marriage is a mirror. In fact, a lot of times what we don't like when we're seeing our marriage is, and we think it's the other person, it's actually a mirror. It's something we don't like in ourselves. It's something from ourselves. Mar nothing will show you you like marriage. Nothing will reveal your insecurities. Nothing will bring up past pains. Nothing will magnify those little parts of you, those buttons you didn't think. You thought you were past it. You thought it was healed. You thought you, that was in your past. All of a sudden, boom. This is one of the ones for me, I just feel like, ooh. Our words. Speak life. We, we, we mentioned last week, Proverbs 18, 20, and 21, from the fruit of their mouth, I'm, I'm almost out of time. From the fruit of their mouth, a person's stomach is filled. 
With the harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. We mentioned it last week. Solomon says, you will eat your words. All of us eat our words. From the fruit of a person's mouth, their stomach is filled. We all eat our words. Which means if I don't like the flavor of my life, or in this case, the flavor of my marriage, then maybe I have to change the flavor of my words. That I season my marriage with my mouth, with my words, with my language. And we talked about it last week. I just want to hit it again this week because I think it's so important. Some of us, some of us just think our words are descriptive. But the Bible teaches that our words are also prescriptive. The difference is one just describes reality. The other one actually creates reality. The power of life and death with your tongue. You are creating the image of God. One of the things that means, God's, God, when God decided to make everything, he didn't, he didn't do it with his hands. He did it with his mouth. He said, let there be, and it was. The, the power of creation in the word of God, and you are made in his image. Life and death in the power of of your tongue. And for some of us, we think we're just describing it. You know, I'm just describing, I'm just telling the truth. That's how he is. That's what she does. I'm just telling the truth. I, I I found that the way I talk about my spouse says way more about me than it does about them. You find somebody bad mouthing their spouse. I like. I hear somebody bad mouthing their spouse. I hear. I, I see somebody on social media talking about like. I, I now granted their spouse. I don't. If I don't know the situation, their spouse may be a jerk. I don't know. But you know what I do know. I don't know anything about them, but I've already decided I know a whole lot about you. You just just go in public, just bringing the fire. Putting it out there? Well, well, if I had a good wife, I would say good things about her. Or, well, if I would say good things about her, I would have a good wife. Descriptive or prescriptive? The power of life and death. I'm not just describing life. I am creating life. I'm not just describing death. I am creating death. I'm killing stuff. Your words can either bring something to life or it can, it can bring it to death. So are you, are you speaking life over your spouse? I, I say this sometimes. I think we're, I think we're good at this. I think we've gotten better at this with regards to our kids. I, I think we're, as a generation, we're more aware of the power of words, like for our kids, right? That, that we're, you can go ahead and start playing, Nick. You there. Might as well start. Might as well do something. Right, so so we like we realize that at some point, um, our children will often they'll live up or down to the words we speak over them. Yeah. You say something over somebody long enough, and they'll begin to believe it. And so, and so we try to be intentional about that about our children. Why, why would we do that for our children and not do that for our spouse? So why would I be intentional? I don't just describe my child. Well, that's just the way he is. He struck out. He got to see. That's just the way. No, no, I'm going to speak life. I'm going to speak to their potential, not just to their past. Right? I'm going to, I'm going to call out. I'm going to prophesy over them. This is what God's going to do in your life. This is who you are. So why would I do that over my children and not over my spouse? Why, why do my words all of a sudden, like I don't realize there's power in my words for one and not the other? Be nice. Speak life. I promise you it'll change. It'll change the flavor of your relationship. It'll taste different. Your marriage will taste different. If you start out from the fruit of their mouth, their stomachs are filled. Oh, man, I got indigestion. Well, you probably shouldn't have eaten that Mexican food late last night. my, 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 My marriage is making me sick to my stomach. Out of the fruit of your mouth, your stomach is filled. Be nice. Speak life. And here's the last one, and we're out of here. Have fun. 
for this one, I'm gonna have to go to a different portion of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter five. I'm gonna give you a few verses. I'm not gonna be too long here. May your fountain be blessed. And if you don't know what the fountain is, just keep reading, pay attention. You'll catch on. And may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you, you always. You saw me stutter there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Verses 15 through 17 that immediately precede this, um, Solomon gives his son and all of us who are reading it um, an admonition to be faithful in our marriages and to avoid sexual immorality, to, to, to have sexual boundaries in our lives. Uh, he said, drink water. He's using a lot of analogies. Drink water from your own cisterns. You know, like you drink water from your from your own pitcher. Um, and he's talking about boundaries. All these things use as cisterns and wells uh, instead of letting your, uh, be like a stream that just kind of runs out into the street. He's talking about sexuality with no boundaries. And so he's talking about what we ought to do in verses 15 through 17. But he talks about how we do that. How do we stay faithful? How do we, how do we drink water out of our own cisterns? How do we, do that, that's what 18 through 20 are about. Don't be intoxicated with some other woman. Why would you be intoxicated with some other woman? And the solution for Solomon is be intoxicated with your own wife. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now he's saying that, the only reason he recalled the wife of your youth is he's talking, about, he's he's talking to his son when his son is no longer a youth. They're not on the honey. Like she's not the wife of your youth when you're still a youth. She's the wife of your youth when you are not so youth anymore. So there's some time that has passed. And Solomon says, you should have the same kind of joy, the same kind of excitement, the same kind of passion. Rejoice over the wife of your youth even when you're not in your youth. I'm talking about a love that lasts. I'm talking about, I'm talking about having fun. I'm talking about maintaining passion. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you avoid sexual immorality? How do, you, how do you not get infatuated with somebody else? Stay infatuated with your spouse. This is one of the places where the idiom fight fire with fire actually works. Like generally speaking, doesn't work. You know how you fight fire? The fire of lust, which by the way, Proverbs talks about is a matter of the heart. Attraction happens with the eyes, right? If you got eyes, you, you can recognize it, uh, beauty and attraction. I'm a man, I've got eyes, right? I'm not talking about attraction. I'm not talking about that's an attractive person. Now bounce them eyes. I'm talking about heart, right? So Solomon would talk about a lustful heart. Jesus would say it like this. Um, if, if you look on one, if you... With your eyes, if you look on a woman with lustful intentions, with a lustful heart, you've already committed adultery with her in your, in your heart. It's a heart, it's a heart issue. One of the commandments is do not covet, and specifically, don't covet another man's wife. Again, it's legislating what not to do, but the empowerment for how to do. I don't covet another man's wife because I'm I'm not just, I'm not just committed because I said a vow, but I'm passionate about, I'm just going to be honest with you. As long as me and Crystal, as long, like, I'm just, if the fire's burning, I don't, I'm not going to be intoxicated with anybody else's wife. You're like, how, how a drunk person going to get, you already drunk. You're dr you, Right? You can tell a drunk person, don't get drunk. Already drunk. So I'm just saying, 
Like, be, that, this is why, by the way, in the New Testament, it says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That the, the reason why some of us chase different intoxicants is because we are lacking something that ought to fill our lives, satisfy our souls. There's something we ought to be drunk on. That's why, that's why when Pentecost happened, Peter had to stand up and say, these men are not drunk like you think they are. They're drunk, but they're drunk on something else. <laughs> I just don't feel it anymore. I just don't feel the passion. I just don't feel the fire. How, how, do you, how do you rejoice in the wife of your youth? By the way, the word rejoice doesn't mean feel joy. It means act joyfully. Rejoice. Which means I can rejoice even if I don't feel joy. For a lot of us, I don't feel what I felt. I would venture to say, if you don't feel what you felt, you're not doing what you did. A lot of us stop doing what we did and then we're shocked that we start feel, stop feeling what we felt. When you were dating, like just think back. Think about what you did when you're trying to get her, when you're trying to get him, when you're, trying to, when you're pursuing, right? Think of all the crazy stuff you did. Think of, think of all the... Like, think of how nice you were. Think of how much you spoke life. Think of all the, think of all the ways, think of all the little things. Think of all the gifts. Like, can we be real? For a lot of us, our gifts went, <laughs> Our kind deeds, woo, like Our words. And then we're shocked that we don't feel what we felt when we're not doing what we did. That's why in the book of Revelation, Jesus is talking to his church and they no longer feel what they felt. They have lost their first love. They've lost the passion they once had. And Jesus' response was, repent and do your first works over. Do what you did so that you can feel what you felt. Well, when I feel what I felt, I'll do what I did. No, no, no. When you do what you did, you can feel what you felt you got to tend this fire. Don't blame the fire because the fire went out. It's not the fire's fault. The fire will burn as long as there's fuel. As long as there's logs, it'll keep burning. But it's my job, put another log on the fire with the wife of my youth. Come on, somebody like a graceful gazelle and a pretty, I don't know, deer. I don't know. We going hunting though. That's what I know. <laughs> hey girl. And have fun. Rejoice. Go on a date. Make love. Like Solomon said, y'all got, some of y'all are, you got married because you love this person. You love being with this person. You had a good time with this person. Then you got married and you stopped it. So do it again. Be nice. Speak life and go have some fun. Amen? Let's pray. Father, with their heads bowed and our eyes closed and just uh, in this moment, I, just, I thank you. I thank you that your wisdom and your word speaks to every part of our lives. I thank you for wisdom for uh, single folks and married folks alike. I thank you, God, that you can teach us how to find and how to fix the relationships that we have. And I'm grateful for that. God, the starting place for what we look for is the fear of the Lord. But some of us, we're, we're looking for in somebody else what we don't have in ourselves. And we're trying to fix a relationship with someone else. And maybe the relationship that first needs to be fixed is our relationship with you. And so if you're here today at any of our locations and, and you just know your relationship with God is not where it needs to be, maybe you've never had a relationship with God, or maybe you used to, but the fires died. Maybe you have lost your first love. Repent and do the first works again. Come back, come back. And if you're here today, you say, Tim, I need to get right with God. I need to start a relationship with God. The good news is that God's already taken the first step. He always takes the first step. That is the good news of the gospel. What you could not do, he did for you. 
that he sent his son. And in this, God demonstrated his love toward us that Christ died for us while we were still sinning, or we were still messing up, or we were far from him, while we weren't worrying about him or thinking about him, he was thinking about us. He took the first step and all you have to do is respond and say yes. So come on, if that's you, pray this in your heart while I pray it out loud. Father, right now, thank you for loving me when I was unlovable, for being faithful to me when I was unfaithful, for pursuing me when I was going in the wrong direction. Today, right now, I repent and I come back to you. Forgive me and cleanse me and wash me and start something new in me. God, I wanna know you and love you. I wanna serve you and follow you all of my days. Give me the grace to do that, I pray right now in Jesus' name. And God, for those of us who are following Jesus, and, and we can be following Jesus, be single and still need wisdom, I pray right now for every single person who's listening today. I pray for wisdom, maybe for some people who are dating, and they're trying to decide. God, I pray for godly wisdom. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead and guide. For some of us who are married, may be married and it's not what it used to be. Maybe not what we thought it would be. Maybe we're trying to fix something and maybe we're trying to fix the wrong thing. We're trying to fix them. God, right now we just declare it's me. God, start with me. I can't change them, but I can let your word change me. So today, yes, God, I'm going to respond to your word. I'm going to be the spouse you want me to be. And I believe that as you work in me, you'll work in them. In Jesus' name. Amen.